Hello and welcome everybody to our next installment of the Fair World Project uh, series of webinars based on all of the emerging policy and activism related to the food system. My name is Ryan Zinn and I am the political director for Fair World Project. And today I've got the honor and uh, joy of introducing my good friend and colleague, Mackenzie Feldman. She is the executive director of Herbicide Free Campus and has also been the author of a number of important briefs with Data for Progress. Welcome and thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me, Ryan. Yeah, so this is really, really exciting. Mackenzie is uh, dialing in from Hawaii. Um, and maybe we start a little bit um, you know, I've been watching a lot of X-Men movies with my kids lately, and I'm, you know, thinking about like origin stories and, and whatnot. Um, you know, maybe why don't you tell us a little bit about your origin story and uh, how you started working with Herbicide Free Campuses. Cool. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, as Ryan said, I am from Hawaii, born and raised, and I, I started Herbicide Free Campus, which is an organization that works to eliminate herbicides from schools, and we work with a number of students across nine states now, 15 schools. And I really got inspired about around the issue of pesticides from my upbringing in Hawaii. Um, Hawaii is ground zero for industrial agriculture. We, 90% of the GMO corn that's grown in the US starts out in Hawaii and they do an immense amount of pesticide testing to make the seeds resistant to the chemicals. And so growing up, I saw frontline communities that were being poisoned by pesticides, standing up to large agribusiness corporations, and was so inspired and knew that one day I wanted to, to join them. And at the same time that Hawaii is ground zero for this pesticide testing, and we see people poisoned and, and waters poisoned and land poisoned, uh, Hawaii is a super inspiring place because at one time, Native Hawaiians fed their communities, you know, were 100% self-sufficient, grew all of their own food, some of the most intricate and genius agricultural systems that the world has ever seen. So kind of growing up with both of these in mind, I was really inspired to, to study food systems in college at UC Berkeley and kind of fell into the, the pesticide issue. It was something that was important to me, but I didn't really know what to do about it. And it, it kind of happened one day at beach volleyball practice, they were spraying herbicides around our court. And me and my teammate thought, you know, this isn't okay. So we worked to get pesticides banned from the court, started this larger campus-wide initiative. And then when I graduated, I expanded it, but always have Hawaii close to home and have done some work there, went back last summer and helped to get all pesticides banned from every public school in the state. So that was a big, big win that I worked on with some folks. Oh, wow, that, that's fantastic. And, and that's such a, a critical point, you know, so yeah, so many young people, especially in sort of like their personal developmental process is being exposed to pesticides at an early age and in a place like a school or university is, is pretty critical for their development and has a pretty big impact on their, you know, their, their, their health. Can you talk a little bit about sort of like the organizing process? How does it work at a specific campus um, to, to get pesticides either regulated or, or kicked out? Yeah, yeah, it's kind of this bottom-up and top-down approach at the same time. Our, our, our big, the, the heart of our mission is working with the groundskeepers. And so a lot of times it can be challenging because they're the ones that are spraying and it's easy to write them off as, you know, bad or they don't care about the health of students and all this stuff. But in reality, they're the ones that are the most exposed, they're the most impacted. Um, and when you look on a broader scale of, of of landscapers and groundskeepers and farm workers, you know, it's predominantly people of color who are paid very small wages and are putting their bodies on the line to either grow and pick our food or to make our, our spaces beautiful. Um, and so we really, really emphasize the first step is meeting with the groundskeepers, seeing where they're coming from, not being in attacking mode and just trying to learn what, what is sprayed, how much are you spraying, how can we help you? When we started this at Berkeley, me and um, the co-founder of Herbicide Free Cal, Bridget Gustafson, we, we came, kind of came at it with a, we were really fired up and we were trying to ask the groundskeeper, what are you spraying? Why are you doing this? You know, like, is this harmful? And, and we got no response. And it wasn't until we kind of switched 
our language and we said, how can we help you? You know, mm -hmm. thank you for everything that you're doing for us. Um, we got a response in 15 minutes and the groundskeeper said, yeah, let's get coffee. Let's talk about this. And since then have had a ton of success organizing work days um, and having both groundskeepers and students working side by side to pick weeds or mulch. So that's, that's the first thing that we say. And we have a whole toolkit. We have um, campus coaches. So if a student wants to do this at their campus, they apply, we interview them. If they're a good fit, we give them a campus coach who checks in with them weekly. And then we have all hands calls every month where all the students meet together um, over Zoom. Uh, this is even before COVID because it's, we're national, so we, we can't unfortunately get everyone together all the time. But um, yeah, we talk about different strategies and we, and we pair students up with experts in lawn care and you know that, that specialize in these things to help them work through different problems, whether that's groundskeepers figuring out how to get rid of certain invasives or what they can do instead. We have, you know, there's organic herbicides, but we're, really what we're trying to push for is um, organic without the use of chemicals, which is compost tea, and that's, um, you know, testing the soil and overseeding and aeration and all of these things that we did at Berkeley and um, we're teaching others how to do, and then we pair them up with the with a group that's ready to go in and help them with this. So. Yeah. Oh, wow, that, that's a pretty amazing like organizing process. It sounds like it's, you know, kind of engaging all of the stakeholders, especially groundskeepers has been pretty successful for you. Yeah, yeah. And it's hard sometimes. Sometimes they completely disagree with us. They don't think that what they're spraying causes cancer or things like that. But um, it really, uh, this point was really um, made clear to me during the, the Lee Johnson versus Monsanto trial of the grounds. He was the first person to sue Monsanto on the basis of glyphosate causing cancer and he won and he was a groundskeeper. And um, that's when I really realized that we had to make groundskeepers always the, the core of our mission. And Lee is now an advisor for Herbicide Free Campus. I met him at the trial and as he's been such a, an amazing mentor for me and I've just learned so much about the positionality of the groundskeeper and how to work with them and he came with us to Hawaii and spoke to the public schools and that's how we were able to get herbicides banned from the schools and even now he's still writing letters and speaking to our students over zoom and is just an incredible person so um, yeah if you haven't heard of his story I encourage you to check it out Lee Johnson versus Monsanto the first person to, to beat Monsanto and win and he's dying of cancer and it's awful but he's really using um, his life to make change and it's really amazing. That's awesome, awesome. Now I know you've kind of shifted gears a little bit, you know, focusing from, you know, working primarily on, on camp college campuses and school campuses and, and looking at really the big picture and we're especially, you know, inspired by the work being done around the Green New Deal. Um, there's been a lot of like, you know, maybe misinformation about the Green New Deal, about both its origins and reach. Uh, I don't know, maybe do you want to give folks just a sense of like, you know, what was behind the, the emergence of the Green New Deal, who was involved and really what inspired you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think the Green New Deal is an, is an idea that's been around for a while, you know, is inspired by the New Deal, which pulled people up out of the Great Depression and was able to um, provide jobs to people and really um, employ a ton of people and really reboot the economy. And so thinking about the Green New Deal is the same idea of giving people clean jobs, transitioning, trying to mitigate climate change and this just transition for workers at the same time. And it's an idea that's been around, but last year, if you're familiar, Ed Markey and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez put out a resolution that kind of laid out the, the bare bones of what this Green New Deal could be. It's not, um, you know, there's been a lot of criticism that it's missing a lot of things and absolutely it's a resolution. It's not um, a piece of policy yet. It's, it can be a lot of different things. It already is becoming a lot of different things in different states and different cities um, and things like that. And I got inspired to work on Green New Deal stuff when um, prior to the resolution coming out in 2019, it was the end of 2018 and Data for Progress, who I had never heard of, had put out um, a report on the Green New Deal that um, actually inspired a lot of the language that came out in the resolution was inspired by this report in 2018. And I read it and maybe like some of you, I noticed that there was um, not much 
a mention of food and agriculture in it, which is um, crazy because food and agriculture has so much potential, both is um, one of the greatest harms right now for, for climate change with animal agriculture and factory farming and monocultures and all these things that we're doing. And at the same time could be one of the biggest solutions with regenerative agriculture and the potential for um, you know, our food system to, to sequester carbon and provide healthy, healthy jobs and healthy food to a lot of people. So um, I thought that this was a huge missing pro proponent of the, of the report. So I just, I'd never heard of them. I reached, I just emailed and said, hey, I noticed this is missing. Would love to work with you to put out some policy briefs on, um, I talked with some people on what would be the best idea. And we kind of came up with this, you know, 10 briefs on food and agriculture, very simple one pagers that could be given to legislators to help them um, with the New Deal legislation. And it hasn't been 10 yet. We're still working on more. It, each topic has become more than one, one page because it was too hard to condense it into one. But since then, fast forward more than a year, turns out there was a couple of other people that came to Data for Progress with the same um, idea. And so they paired us together and I um, have now a couple of colleagues that we've been working with for more than a year and we've put out um, some briefs on antitrust, rural economic revitalization, ocean policy, which um, Elizabeth Warren actually um, adapted into her Blue New Deal policy, which was really cool. Um, regenerative agriculture, um, and most recently our land access brief, which I'm personally most proud of. And um, I learned a ton about, I didn't, I knew basically nothing about policy before, but um, it was my job to pull in all the experts and people who were working on the front lines of these issues and, and ask them what would be most helpful. And I think a lot of people feel uh, reserved when it comes to policy. Like you feel like you don't, you're not equipped to be able to write national policy, but when you really just ask people, well, what would you change, you know, in your job right now? Or what, what could you change in your life if you were the ones that were writing the rules? And, um, oops, sorry about that. I don't know what that happened. Um, then, you know, people have a bunch of ideas, it turns out. So that was a really, really cool process. That's great. Why don't we maybe start with like the, the first brief that you did on, on regenerative agriculture? You know, for those that may not be familiar or have no real kind of clear connection to, to farming, um, you know, how would you define regenerative agriculture and, you know, how does that kind of play out in, in the big picture? Yeah, absolutely. I would, I think folks probably describe regenerative agriculture in a number of different ways. When I think about regenerative agriculture, I'm thinking about regenerative organic agriculture. Um, one kind of uh, maybe differentiated aspect, and Ryan, I'd be interested to hear your views on this as you specialize in regenerative agriculture, but um, um, a lot of people, you know, organic, you can still till and regenerative. The whole goal is that you're not tilling the soil, um, but if you're not tilling the soil, then sometimes that would require more herbicides. And so I'd like to think of regenerative organic, like the Rodale Institute has been a really great model for this. Um, but also recognize that it's really hard. And for those who don't know, tilling is like you're tilling up the soil and we have a huge problem in this country of loss of topsoil. And so when you're tilling the soil, you can lose topsoil. Um, but at the same time, if you're spraying herbicides, also not good for soil health. So when I think of regenerative agriculture, that's that would be the goal is regenerative organic. And with regenerative agriculture, often with the use of animals, um, there's the potential to sequester carbon and store it in the soil. So the policy, I was really, really lucky to work with John Eichard, co-authored the regenerative agriculture policy with him. And he um, is a former agricultural economist and had a lot of really amazing ideas about what regenerative agriculture could look like in this country. And before, before talking with him, I was talking with a number of soil scientists and um, there was ideas on how can we inform, reform crop insurance and, you know, tweak things in the farm bill. And um, then I kind of stopped for a second and thought, you know, the point of using this platform of data for progress is to push ideas. It doesn't mean that these are going to get passed tomorrow, just like the Green New Deal. But the point is to start the conversation. Let's put out 
you know, radical ideas because um, we have a, a crisis that has already come and it's going to get a lot worse. And if we don't put these ideas out there now and start thinking about ways that we can implement them, you know, we've totally missed the boat. And so kind of stopped and, and then I was really lucky to get in touch with John Eichert and he had a lot um, of great ideas of not reforming crop insurance. How could we think of a system that doesn't use crop insurance and doesn't, doesn't, you know, incentivize farmers to just grow fence row to fence row of one crop, but instead pay people for ecological services and conservation and, um, and, and, and train them on a way to, you know, come up with a plan of, of growing many different things and, and, and growing things that are the most climate friendly and all of these sorts of, of plans. Um, so yeah, that's what the, the premise of the, of the report is about. And we have a lot of great stats in there about soil health and how to build soil health and how can we um, really, a lot of these programs already exist. We just need to put more funding into them to, to support farmers that don't want to make this transition. Yeah, that, that's what I really liked about the report because it was both like big picture, very radical in many regards, but there's actually some pretty neat projects or you know programs already within the United States Department of Agriculture that if they were fully funded or expanded could do, you know, huge, you know, huge impacts. And so I thought that part was really, really good because most folks, you know, especially on the consumer advocate, you know, or activist realm, you know, they may not know kind of all the ins and outs of the USDA. I mean, it's a, it's a big agency, has a lot of potential and power. And I, I really like the, the way that you paired those up. That was, that was really impactful. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. And yeah. I'm, I'm curious for you, how do you think about regenerative agriculture and, um, yeah, maybe what are the difficulties you've seen with farmers on on how to do this or? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I think like you, I was also inspired by the Rodale Institute's work. You know, they came out with this uh, white paper, wow, it must have been five years ago, uh, which really kind of propelled this concept of regenerative organic agriculture into the I don't know what it, I wish it was mainstream, but you know, at least within our groups, it was really kind yeah. of a, a pivotal moment. Um, and We'd so, like, like you said, yeah, exactly. <laughs> we're, we're almost there. Um, so yeah. that part was really great because it, it allowed sort of both the framework to uh, do some sort of reflection on the way we've been farming, both you know conventionally, but also within the organic realm. You know, um, one of the things you touched upon both in kind of the brief and as well as your work with herbicide free campuses is like. You know, doing organic agriculture is, is tough because you can't really use the same tools that a conventional farmer does, like herbicides. Um, and this is something we see both domestically and internationally. You know, there's less farmers, there's less farm workers, and so her herbicides, for example, is just like a tool that people use in many cases, not because they like it, but you know, to, to not use it requires a lot more labor. Um, and so those are, you know, anyways, we can get go down a full rabbit hole of why herbicides exist and what they mean for farmers. But um, what I really liked about the paper that they did was it sort of brought together this sort of like um, connection of, you know, um, both addressing the climate crisis, but also improving on-farm resiliency. I mean, you know, the one thing that we're seeing in the countryside, you know, in rural communities all over the world is, you know, just a, a, a much more unstable, uh, you know, climate, which has big impacts both for livelihoods of farmers, which are already under pressure from the marketplace, but also, you know, things like, you know, drought, excessive rain, not enough rain, all these things have real big impacts on farmers. So um, to be able to have a suite of tools that really helps improve their resiliency and, and build soil health, I think is pretty, pretty exciting. Yeah, yeah. And like you said, um, with floods and droughts and things like that, a lot of these, I think there's a huge potential with agriculture to move people politically um, because a lot of these rural farmers in rural America, um, you know, are seen, maybe are climate deniers or, or aren't discussing it with their neighbors, but they're, you know, they're not stupid. They're smart people and they're seeing the impacts that floods and droughts are having on their land. And so, I think that there are a lot of misconceptions about the Green New Deal and what it would mean and, you know, taking away airplanes or hamburgers and things like that. But if you can really break it down and get people to see, oh, actually, this could support and even make your livelihood better. And you wouldn't have to feel this pressure of having to, you know, produce, produce, produce um, in the face of, of, of floods and droughts and having to, you know, not even just to forget about your yield for a year because it was all ruined. Like these are things that are going to help you and help the world. Um, 
there's huge potential there. And I wish right now we could be knocking on doors and connecting with people and learning from them. Um, un unfortunately, COVID prevents us from talking with our, our neighbors and our brothers and sisters in other areas that maybe disagree with us because I think those are the most important conversations we need to have. But I think people are figuring out ways um, to do that remotely in the best way that we can. Yeah, I, what I what I like about sort of like the Green New Deal as a frame is that it is really broad. It, as you said, it's very radical, um, but it kind of accelerates and scales out, you know, these practices, you know, the organic, you know, marketplace has been great. You know, the organic market is, you know, whatever, $50 billion a year, but it's still just a really small percentage of overall land, you know, cropland in the United States. And for us to be able to you know, feed people with healthy food and turn back climate change. We need a, a, a bigger prog program that, you know, comes with some really, you know, strong federal funding. So I thought yeah. that was really great for, for you all to sort of include those important aspects in, in the broader Green New Deal conversation. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, and so the second, the brief that you worked on and supported dealt a lot with in terms of access to land. So give us like a snapshot of like, you know, what that looks like here in the United States. Yeah. Um, that brief, really excited about it, got to work with uh, Leah Penniman from Soul Fire Farm, who does amazing work. Um, Soul Fire Farm is a, um, is a Black, Indigenous, people of color, led and run farm in New York. And Leah does a lot of work with um, land access and, and thinks a lot about policy as well, and wrote a book called Farming While Black. And I was shocked to learn. I didn't, I knew that obviously there's increased barriers for socially disadvantaged farmers, people of color, um, but I had, I did not know to that extent. Um, and what I learned from writing this brief was that, um, you know, in the 20th century, 98% of black farmers were just possessed from their land. Now black farmers make up 2% of farmers in this country. And so a lot of this brief was talking about how to lower the barriers for, for young farmers, for beginning farmers, um, for people of color. And when I was talking with Leah, it's like, wow, it's this great initiative that she has to um, teach young um, people of color how to be farmers and then sends them out into the world. And it's next to impossible to, to start a farm especially if you're a beginning farmer or if you're a farmer of color and if you're both um it's crazy and so this brief is is talking about how can we change that how can we support farmers how can we lower the barriers um because the reality is there are a lot of people in this country that want to be farmers especially young people and we need that that's part of the green new deal that's the whole just transition is if we're going to have more localized um agriculture we're gonna have a healthy food system we have to support farmers yeah it, in that regard you know we see sort of like the land tenure issues that a big barrier all over the world what are some of the kind of governmental levers that could be pulled or you know worked on um to be able to improve you know uh you know farmland access to um all young farmers folks of color etc similar to the one we did on regenerative agriculture it's funding, increased funding for programs that already exist to train farmers. Um, and in terms of, of increasing access, um, a lot of, yeah, honestly, I think that part is not my um, wheelhouse. I could like name what we wrote, but I think probably Leah or Mel would be better to talk about those. Oh, wait. Oops, sorry. Sorry. Yeah, no, that, yeah, no problem. Maybe we'll have to bring them on and uh, you know talk with them uh, in the next round for sure. Yeah, yeah. It, you know, w one thing that we see you know internationally is that um, you know access to land is is really a, a big challenge depending on the, the local um, you know context, especially for for women farmers. You know, it, you know farmers can't um, show a title in many cases um, if the title is in their husband's name or not in their own name. Um, it's hard to get access to you know credit, for example. Um, you can't sell, you know, um, or get access to even to a bank account. So, you know, this is something that is, um, you know, kind of a universal challenge. And so by addressing it here in the United States, hopefully we can kind of continue that momentum and join the larger uh, social movements, you know, at a global scale. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and just generally it's like um, increased grant and loan guarantees and um, 
you know, supporting more cooperatively owned farms and things like that. But um, yeah. <laughs> well, good. So I know you're working on a couple more briefs and, you know, some of this process is actually looking forward towards the, the upcoming elections. And, you know, I know there's been a lot of discussion about, you know, how could any sort of economic stimulus happen during the coronavirus? How could we actually get, you know, sort of, uh, you know, priorities that really reflect the social social movements needs in there? And so what have you been hearing, you know, amongst your colleagues at Data for Progress and, and with your own networks? Yeah, I think yeah, we're coming up with a few more briefs and we really see, you know, an opportunity now that the um, Democratic, um, you know, uh, presidential candidate has been chosen. Now that we know that it's going to be Joe Biden, um, there's an uh, sad, we are sad that Bernie dropped out. Um, but now that we know it's going to be Joe Biden, there's an opportunity there to put pressure on him. He knows he has to win um, the young people's votes. And there's uh, an opportunity to put pressure on him to support um, the Green New Deal and support some of these policies that we've been trying to push. And frankly, now we, this is the biggest case for the Green New Deal with coronavirus. I mean, there's never been a bigger case for, for Medicare for all, for an immense amount of people that are unemployed and will be unemployed. And you know, how can we pull them up just like the New Deal and transition them to green jobs? And it's not like through this crisis, climate change has gone away. No, I mean, we're gearing towards summer. Um, we're gonna see a lot of the climate effects um, happening again. And I think we have an opportunity here. I don't think it, it was upsetting to during the stimulus talks to hear Republicans say that this Green New Deal is a distraction and the Democrats are trying to use this time to push their agenda. And I don't think we have to see, you know, efforts to mitigate climate change and also mitigate coronavirus as two separate things. I think there's an opportunity here to, to reboot the economy. Um, and support the Green New Deal. And, but I think it's hard at the same time because so many of our efforts have to be focused on coronavirus right now as they should be. Um, but in terms of food and agriculture, we're seeing this, it's just being reinforced how important food and farm workers are that are on the front lines. You know, they were treated, they're treated with no dignity in our society. And now guess what? They're the only one, they're the most essential workers. They're the ones that are working you know, 24 seven, um, and it's farm workers, it, a majority of them undocumented are um, not included in, in these benefits and in, in medical care and the stimulus package and things like that, which is crazy because they're the most vulnerable and they're putting their health on the line at this time. Um, so I think we see an opportunity here for a way to reimagine the dignity of food workers and what they deserve and there's a lot of great organizations pushing for um, for policy recommendations um, that can improve their their livelihoods. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I, I think you know, looking back at sort of the, the New Deal and you know the the sort of the history of different social movements, it's really at these times of just really you know social upheaval and, and major crises that you know we really have to jump in and, and take action for sure. So it, kind of in that vein, you know, um, you know, where can folks, you know, learn more about your work at Herbicide Free Campuses and, and the work you're doing with Data for Progress? Yeah, um, we, for Herbicide Free Campus, we, our website is www.herbicidefreecampus.org and follow along with what we're doing. We'll be putting out a lot more content and hopefully if, if schools start up again in the fall, um, we'll have expanded to a lot more schools. So if you're interested in learning about how we did this in your community and want to start something like this, just reach out and um, we can provide you with a bunch of resources. Um, and to learn more about what uh, folks are doing, well, to see our Data for Progress memos, you can go to dataforprogress.org. Um, and I think that's the website, let me double check. Um, yeah, dataforprogress.org. And then you can see there's a Green New Deal tab and you can look through our memos. They put out a lot of amazing work, not, Food and agriculture is just a small bit of what they do. Um, they do a lot of incredible polling and put out memos all the time. They work very fast and we'll be putting out some more. So, um, to, you know, keep an eye on that. Um, in terms of, of groups doing really good work, um, Heal Food Alliance has a whole um, advice on the COVID-19 stimulus package and what we should be telling our legislators um, to support food and farm workers. And, um, 
Also, if you haven't seen the, the green stimulus plan, um, maybe we can send out a link for that as well and you can still um, put your name on that. Um, that was a, a lot of amazing uh, organizations, including Data for Progress, that put that together. Um, yeah, do you, have a, do you have groups to recommend? Thinking National Sustainable Agriculture uh, Coalition has some really good ideas on policy and, and actions you can take right now to, to sign petitions and, and tell your lawmakers. Although it is hard, lawmakers are very focused on, on COVID right now, but they do a good, a good job of weaving in how this relates to COVID, but yeah. yeah ab absolutely, I was gonna mention them for sure. You know, they seem to be really focusing, you know, pretty clearly on the, the family farm level, certainly National Family Farmers Coalition, you know, as part of that greater effort, I think is another uh, good resource. And, and then also Fair Road Project is a member of the Food Chain Workers Alliance. Um, mm -hmm. So they're working yeah. with frontline organizations and, and we're really hoping to help uh, support, you know, folks that can and would like to contribute to those organizing efforts or those early funds um, to definitely check them out at Food Chain Workers Alliance as well. So I feel like there's a, a lot of work to be done, both in terms of organizing and, you know, where we can, you know, be in solidarity with frontline organizations and communities. Um, you know, if you have some, some extra um, money to be able to share, um, really now is the time to do so, um, just because, um, you know, not only are they struggling with sort of the, the reality of COVID and the financial crisis, but, um, you know, really the Trump administration has been going all in on undermining um, their ability to organize. Um, so this is a, a pretty critical time. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's hard to, you can't have a healthy food system if you're not taking care of the people that are growing and producing and packaging and transporting our food. And so this time, more than any, uh, really highlights the need for us to come through and support them. And even if you don't care about other people, it directly affects you because uh, without these people, we literally wouldn't have food. Um, but I think that, yeah, this definitely highlights uh, the need for people to support frontline workers. Yeah, agreed 100%. Well, Mackenzie, I want to thank you so much for your time and, and all your great work. It's very inspiring. And uh, yeah, we look forward to uh, continuing this conversation uh, on all things Green New Deal, um, you know, coming up. And uh, yeah, thank you so much. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks so much for having me, Ryan.